Hi, good evening, everyone. So today I'm pleased uh, to welcome Dr. Carol Lavenderla to the MDL uh, Falmouth Forum. So Carol Lavender Law is a research professor at the Sea Education Association. She holds a PhD uh, in, in physical oceanography from a Scripps Institution of Oceanography and a bachelor in mathematics from Duke University. Dr. Law's research interests include large scale and mesoscale ocean circulation and plastic marine pollution specifically the distribution of plastic marine debris driven by ocean physics and the degradation and ultimate fate of plastics in the ocean, main focus of this talk today. So Dr. Law has more than 12 months at sea, time on research vessels, including in the Eastern North Pacific and Western North Atlantic Oceans, where a lot of plastic debris accumulates. In 2008, Cara began the analysis of Sea Education Association Ocean Plastics Dataset, collected in thousands of collected in thousands of plankton net toes over more than 30 years by the sea semester students and faculty. And with this unique ongoing long time series, which is really, really unique, um, Cara published in several journals. Uh, such as science in 2010 and 2014. Just I'm telling you this to just like to let you know like how unique is the data that Cara actually has and how uh, uh, her team. Cara has uh, helped lead efforts both locally and globally to address the problem of ocean plastic pollution. So linking science to solutions. On the local level, here in Falmouth, Cara led a team that received a NOAA Marine Debris Program grant to reduce um, the use of single-use plastic items. And not just, not just that, she also works with her local community in Maine to promote this plastic redu reduction. And is on the board of directors of the Gulf of Maine Marine Education Association. Additionally, last year, in 2018, Cara testified about ocean plastics pollution before the U.S. Senate Committee on Environmental and Public Works. On a more international scale, CARA participated in a United Nations Scientific Advisory. Um, she also has served as a science advisor to the Trice Free Sea Alliance, led by the Ocean Conservancy, Conservancy a group of nonprofit leaders working uh, toward uh, a notion free of trash. So as you can see with all that I just explained, um, Cara has done a lot uh, to raise awareness of the issue of plastic pollution through papers, uh, articles, interviews, talks, through global and local communities and initiatives. But I want to remind you also that as an educator, she's preparing the next generation of scientists and non-scientists, so everyone, to continue working to have a cleaner ocean environment. So thank you for that, Cara. <laughs> Today, we will learn how Cara and her team has brought scientific rigor to the popular field, what we know, and it's been, we've been hearing ocean plastic pollution, helping dispel misconception. So is it real, not, in which way, why, from where it comes from. So quantifying the problem and identifying possible pathways uh, to reduce this problem. So uh, just remind you again, as Anne say, just like silence your most used plastic based object, your phone. <laughs> um, and please join me uh, in welcoming Carol Lavender. Thank you. That was very generous. Well, good evening, everybody. And first, I have to thank Ruth for an extremely generous um, introduction. I'm not sure where she dug up all of that information. Um, and I will try to live up to the billing. Uh, I also want to thank Susan Morris for the invitation to come speak with you tonight. It's a pleasure to be speaking in Falmouth, where um, I have been working with Sea Education for, oh gosh, what are we coming up? Oh, more than 15 years. I'm now based in Maine, but I do come down here fairly regularly, and so it's a pleasure to be speaking to um, a local crowd. And also for uh, thanks to the MBL for hosting and for a lovely meal. 
So actually, let me back up one second. Thanks to all of you for spending your Friday evening here listening to a talk about trash. <laughs> um, I'm really heartened to see this many people are interested. So I'm going to talk to you today, sort of giving you an overview of my perspective of ocean plastics pollution from sources to solutions. And I want to start with kind of my entree into this world, which can be summarized by this image of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So when I first heard about this problem, it was more than a decade ago, and it was from a journalist who emailed somebody at SCA and said, I hear you sail in the North Pacific, do you sail through this fabled garbage patch? And I had never heard of it. Um, a little bit of digging, found some descriptions about a floating island of trash, twice the size of Texas, so thick you could walk on it of everyday items. You could see this from space. Um, all kinds of descriptions of something that, if, were, if it were true, would, would almost be a tractable problem in the sense that you could identify it, find its edges, and potentially try to clean it up. Um, in fact, these are misconceptions. And at Sea Education Association, just up the road here, student, students and faculty scientists have been collecting data for decades. And we knew in-house that this was not an accurate description of the problem. So we realized that the time had come for the rest of the world to know about what our little educational nonprofit was doing. And I was fortunate to be in the right time in the right place to analyze the data set that Root so nicely described. So um, I'm going to tell you that story in a little bit more detail. But first, I want to talk about the conception. So if you had an idea about a floating island of trash, we're going to put that aside. And from my experience sailing out in the open ocean and the places that you would refer to as garbage patches, these are more typical images of what you would find if you were standing on the deck of a ship. So you look over the side, often there's very light winds, you see water and clouds, and occasionally something might float by that's very surprising. So in this case, we have a boot, we have a five-gallon bucket that's all encrusted with some kind of um, organic matter. More often than not, you would see something that is clearly an item, a man-made item, but you maybe don't know what exactly what it is. We think, these are probably fishing buoys of some kind. This is some kind of container. You might see a large fragment that's pretty clearly made of plastic. And in extremely rare cases, you might see very recognizable items that you can trace to an actual source. So these are pictures that were taken on our ship that sails in the Pacific Ocean about 18 months after the Japanese um, tsunami. So this was in October 2012 on the opposite side of the Pacific Ocean. And we saw things, the crew on the ship saw this floating refrigerator going by. We, of course, couldn't recover it. But inside this drawer, you could see these food packaging items and an egg tray. So really shocking on many levels. Um, this was somebody's appliance and their food that got washed into the ocean that drifted across. We found also um, other clearly recognizable items. There's a tire back here. There's some fishing buoys, the food packaging. There's um, bottles with clearly Asian characters, a soccer ball. Um, there was also this, this dinghy that was drifting, had been weighted down by the barnacles growing on it that kind of, this is pressed right up against the side of our vessel. So in this instance, we can't say with 100% certainty, but it's pretty clear that these were items that washed out to sea and traveled across um, after the tsunami. So instead, you know, that's a very rare instance. I don't think we've had another occasion like that. But in these regions, the subtropical ocean gyres, what you typically see are these microplastics. So this is a sieve and a, a student with some tweezers. And you just see these brightly colored fragments that are irregularly shaped. And there's different sizes and different colors. This is not a big item. It's not a water bottle. But it's still plastic. And it's still a contaminant. So we hear a lot about microplastics, but in fact, the category of materials we're talking about are broadly referred to as marine debris, so man-made items in the marine environment. And I just want to take a minute to acknowledge other aspects of the marine debris problem. So trash on the beach is also marine debris. These are images taken by a colleague at Ocean Conservancy. This is a beach in Lima, Peru, that pretty clearly serves as an open dumping site. If you look at the sort of materials here, it looks like everyday items. and in uh, Hong Kong, this largely looks like a lot of sort of fishing debris, or maybe debris that has washed ashore. So even though maybe here in Falmouth we typically don't see things that look like this, we have all gone to the beach and found different types of items, trash type items. Well, the International uh, Coastal Cleanup has been going on for more than 30 years now, carried out by Ocean Conservancy. 
And they've done a great job logging the types of items that are collected. And the number, the top 10 list of items collected has not actually changed substantially over that 30-year period. And the things that are picked up are things that we all recognize, that we all use every day, although I hope we don't all use this every day, but cigarette butts, food wrappers, beverage bottles that are plastic, glass, grocery bags, cups and plates. Um, in 2018, I believe it was the first time that the top 10 items on the list were all made of plastic. So glass bottles had dropped off um, and other types of bags had dropped off. So marine debris is made up of items that we all use every day. You're probably not surprised also to know that marine debris is also found on the seafloor. So this is an Im a collection of images taken by the Rosalia Project with a remotely operated vehicle in Newport Harbor in Rhode Island. And so you it's probably hard to see, but there are plastic water bottles and cups and cans and beverage items. Again, trash that is ending up sitting on the seafloor. But there are also things like large derelict fishing nets. This was a photo from Midway Atoll in the, in the North Pacific. Um, uh, this is actually a debris removal effort. So the marine debris on the seabed also takes lots of different forms. It can be consumer items, it can be large derelict fishing gear, and other strange items too, I'm sure. But you may be surprised to learn that marine debris is also found in very deep and very remote places. So this is an image of a plastic bag that just looks pristine from 2,500 meters depth in Fram Strait in the Arctic. So even in very remote places, far from human populations, we're finding identifiable trash items. So we hear a lot about microplastics and why is that? Well, first and foremost, microplastics by count are the most abundant type of debris in the marine environment. So counting individual particles. And they're also the most widespread. So microplastics, these tiny bits, can be found on beaches. This is a photo from um, the big island of Hawaii, Camilla Beach, which is well known for being trash collecting beach. These microplastics are found in the water column in the ocean. So this is a picture of uh, plastics collected on one of our ships in the North Atlantic. But they are also below the sea surface too. What we collect is at the sea surface. Microplastic fragments have also been found in deep sea sediments. So these little um, pinpoints are showing you where these were collected. So broadly around um, the North and South Atlantic and also in the Mediterranean Sea, these fragments have been found. And then most recently, there have also been microplastics found in Arctic sea ice. And here we start to see this form called, that people refer to as microfibers. So this is kind of the newest character, the newest category of microplastics that's starting to get a lot of attention. So even frozen into Arctic sea ice. So microplastics, especially microfibers, seem to be quite ubiquitous in the marine environment. And so for that reason alone, I think people are really starting to focus on research into microplastics. Well, how is it that plastics, plastic debris, microplastics have become so widespread in the environment? And microplastics, by the way, are not limited to the marine environment. There is also increasing work showing that microplastics are found in rivers, in lakes, even high alpine lakes. Um, they are in agricultural soils, they are in our drinking water, tap water, bottled water, they're in beer, they're in sea salt. It seems that wherever we look, we can find little bits of plastic. So why is that? So this figure is showing you the um, two curves. The blue line is global plastics production in units of million metric tons as a function of time. So 1950 is sort of the canonical start of global plastics production from um, sort of industrial production, consumer plastics. And so what you can see is that over time, this curve is pretty much exponentially increasing. There's a little dip here because of a global recession, but the increase in global plastics production has actually outpaced most other commodity materials, including steel and cement. So the growth in plastics is notable and from our estimation, since the beginning of this um, commercial production, humans have produced about 8.3 billion metric tons of plastics. That number is so big that it doesn't matter if I describe it to you in terms of Empire State Buildings or blue whales or football stadiums, it's huge. It's a huge amount of material. So what happens to that material? The red line is showing you plastic waste generation globally. So in this study, we tracked plastics production and we tried to follow sort of the uses through sectors like packaging or transportation or industrial purposes. And we asked what's happened as that plastic waste has been generated? How has it been handled? And what we found is that the vast majority has either been landfilled or is sitting in the environment. Less than 10% has been recycled and about 11% has been incinerated. 
So when you look collectively at all of this 8.3 billion tons that we've produced, between what's still in use and what's in landfills or in the environment, we estimate that about 90% of that material is still in existence on the planet. So this is a tremendous amount of material, but even back when we were only producing maybe 10 or 15 million metric tons, back in 19, early 1960, there was evidence of this material ending up in the environment and contaminating wildlife. So there was a paper published in 1969 that documented, this is a seabird, if you can't tell. Um, the seabird is, it's a seabird carcass that has plastic debris in its gut. So this was first described um, in 1960. The first description of floating plastics in the open ocean was published by Huey scientists in the 1970s from the North Atlantic. Um, these are little industrial resin pellets and then microplastic fragments. And then SEA first started getting into the microplastics business in a formal way in the mid-1980s, thanks to a scientist named Jude Wilbur, who's still a Falmouth resident. And he published a paper in Oceanus magazine documenting some of our early data collection in the North Atlantic. But really, it wasn't until 2003 when a man named Charles Moore described in Natural History magazine a sail from Hawaii to San Francisco in which he coined the term garbage patch and described this pollution problem in a very visual way that has sort of led to some of these images and descriptions of, um, of you know, appalling islands of trash. But he coined the term garbage patch in this article, and it really took hold. People could have, finally had a vision of what this might look like. And just a year later, Richard Thompson in the UK published a paper where the term microplastics was first used and first described. So if we look at sort of the scientific interest and scientific articles that have been written about marine debris or plastics in the ocean, since then, I would argue that that curve probably looks something like these curves. There's been a tremendous increase in scientific attention to the topic. I think that's in large part due to the tremendous increase in public attention to the topic. So why do we care about this? I mean, of course, there's an aesthetics problem, and we should take clean up our messes. But really, I think most people are concerned because of the potential impacts of marine debris with marine life. So this is a figure showing um, the number of individual animals that encountered some form of marine debris according to taxonomic group, marine mammals, fish, birds, and sea turtles. And this color coding is a little bit crazy, but all I really want you to see is that the black and white um, parts of these bars uh, is uh, describing interactions with plastic debris. And the colors are other materials like glass, metal, or they're unknown. And so um, in this study, which was published a few years ago now, where they did a literature review, they found evidence of encounters with marine debris in more than 800 species. And of those encounters, 90% of those encounters were with plastics. And in fact, 17% of those species that were encountering this debris were listed as threatened or endangered on the IUCN list. So these are species that are already threatened. And in fact, we're talking about tens of thousands of animals. And in some cases, we're talking about all of the species. Um, so all the species of sea turtles, for instance, have been interacting with marine debris and about 50% of species of marine mammals and seabirds. Well, what are these, what do I mean by encounters? So marine debris encounters take a few forms, and you'll be familiar with some of these. The most obvious, I think, is entanglement. So here's an example of a bird entangled, it looks like a balloon string, um, and some sea turtles with probably some derelict fishing gear. So entanglement causes pretty obvious um, consequences. There can be very severe injury, can be linked to death. Um, so we know that there is certainly a risk to animals when they encounter some of this debris. And the entanglement debris is often uh, fishing gear or fishing line, but can also anything really looping. So packing straps that go around sort of cartons or bait boxes, anything that's looping can um, be a threat to these animals. What we know is this is a threat to individuals. What we don't know is what the impact is on populations. So especially a population of, of a threatened species, for instance. And that's very hard to know because we don't encounter all of these animals. Much of what's reported is what's been, you know, you report what you can find or that you can see. You can't survey all sea turtles. So this is very, a very clear risk. Um, thinking about not just large debris, going to, to smaller debris, we know that marine life is, um, interacting with it as a substrate or as a sort of floating platform. So species are transported in association with debris. In this case, we're looking at some fish that are swimming below this net. We know that fish tend to 
swim underneath things that are floating. This is why fishers create fish aggregation devices to try to draw the fish to them. And so in this case, we could have species that just by following this debris can end up outside of their normal ranges. Um, here we're talking, looking at now species that are actually using the debris as a platform. So this is a, uh, likely a child's ball from that Japanese tsunami. And what you can see is it fits in the palm of your hand. There's this crab here. There are barnacles on it. And these are traveling along with that debris across the ocean. There was a recent study about a year, year ago, I think, by Jim Carlton down in Williams Mystic documenting more than, I think, close to 300 living coastal species that were transported by debris from the Japanese tsunami over the course of six years. And this was really an unprecedented rafting event, the consequences of which are really not yet known yet because we don't know if these species were able to establish at a place then become invasive. That is the concern. But even we get, if we go down to these microplastics, there are rich communities living in these biofilms, communities of microorganisms. So this was a paper by um, Eric Zettler, formerly of SDA, and other colleagues, um, Linda Amaral Zettler at the MBL, and uh, Tracy Minzer, formerly of HUI, that looking at the communities of microorganisms living in these biofilms on microplastics. And what they found is that the communities of organisms living on the plastic are quite different from what's living in the surrounding seawater or even living on natural substrates. And at this point, we don't really know what they're doing here, how they're making a living. If There's big questions about whether or not they're degrading the material, but they're clearly living, they're creating their own ecosystem here that's been dubbed the plastosphere. So the final impact I'll discuss, and, but not necessarily the final impact of, of marine debris and plastic debris is probably something you've heard of too and been concerned about is ingestion. So I showed you that early seabird image, which the modern day version looks like this. This is an albatross chick on Midway Atoll, photographed as it was found. And you can see inside its belly, a cigarette lighter and a bottle cap and other fragments of plastic. And this, has, um, this, this image has largely become sort of the poster child for the, the, um, the problem of ingestion of, of plastic debris, because it hits home when you see things that you recognize and maybe that you use every day. So at this point, we know that at least 220 species have ingested plastic debris. And these are animals that are not just sort of larger charismatic animals, but animals even as small as zooplankton. So these are um, zooplankton collected in the North Atlantic that had ingested microplastics inside of them. Um, this is a study from my colleague Deb Goodwin at SEA and a colleague looking at um, barnacles that were living on this uh, buoy, again, probably from the Japanese tsunami. And inside the barnacles, they found these tiny pieces of microplastics. And then yes, fish and of course, large marine mammals and uh, turtles and other animals are also eating these, these particles. So this is the fish that was swimming below that five gallon bucket that I showed you at the very beginning of the talk. Um, that fish was swimming under the bucket following it and by some lucky chance, both ended up in our plankton net. And when we cut open this fish, we found 42 pieces of microplastic in its stomach. So we know that you know the smaller the particle, the more things can eat it. And the big whales can eat you know, yards and yards of plastic sheeting and car parts. And I mean, the things you read about are just appalling, but even the smallest animals in the food chain are ingesting microplastics. Now, part of the reason this is of concern, of course, nobody really should be eating plastic. We don't eat plastic voluntarily. There's no nutritive value. Um, there could be internal injury caused, especially if you're eating a big car part that clogs up your insides or causes internal damage. But I think a big part of the concern has to do with the chemicals that are associated with the plastic debris in the marine environment. So plastics have a, a variety of chemicals associated with them. Some of them are actually ingredients, so chemical additives that alter the material's color or flexibility or they're antimicrobial. Lots of added chemical additives are included. There's also byproducts to man due to manufact the manufacturing process. Um, and many of these may be um, toxic or hazardous. And then there's also a category of contaminants that are already present in seawater that would prefer to stick to plastic rather than be dissolved in seawater. So these are legacy contaminants like PCBs and DDTs. Um, we know that these chemicals can be harmful. And the question, the big outstanding question is, if an animal eats the plastic debris that has these chemicals associated with it, do those chemicals transfer into the tissues of the organism and cause damage? And then taking that a step further, if we eat that animal, are we poisoning ourselves with plastic? So these are very open questions, and I would say the focus of a great breadth of research at this point. People are um, conducting 
controlled laboratory experiments and have found evidence of harm either to individual animals or um, growth or reproductive effects. The challenge is that um, and a laboratory experiment, by necessity, is, is constructed to test a single outcome. So there's a certain type of animal, a certain type of plastic with a certain chemical constituent. You know, size and shape of plastic is, is constant. You're trying to keep a lot of things controlled. And you'll get an outcome, and that is very informative. But you can't easily take that result and, and apply it to the natural environment, where we really don't even know what kinds of plastics many of these animals are exposed to. So there, at this point, I would say there is certainly reason for concern. Um, I'm not panicking, but we should continue studying it uh, at this point to sort of try to figure out what these impacts might be. But back to this uh, human health question, which really, I think, for many people is one of the ultimate um, goals to understand is, you know, is there plastic in our seafood? This is a study from my colleague, uh, Chelsea Rockman. She gathered uh, seafood from a seafood market in Half Moon Bay, California and analyzed it, um, either the whole animal, if it was shellfish, or the gut, if it was um, fish, uh, for microplastics. And actually, yes, there's plenty of microplastics in our seafood. Um, it was, I would say, maybe 20%, 20, 25% of the animals they looked at had microplastics in them. Typically, there were small numbers of particles, zero to at most 10 particles. Many of them were these fibers. Um, the question is, does it matter? So I mentioned that there's also been microfibers in our water and in our beer and all these kinds of things. In terms of seafood, um, we don't typically eat the guts of fish. And so at least for particles above a certain size, they may stay in the gut of the fish. They might be egested. We're probably not eating those. But certainly with shellfish, it's in the tissue. We eat the whole animal. So we are probably eating microplastics in our seafood. But as I alluded to a second ago, contamination doesn't necessarily imply an impact. So contamination, we certainly know that animals are encountering debris. There are certain instances where we can find a very clear harmful impact. But in the instance of seafood, I think the jury is out whether or not there is a measurable impact to either the marine animal or to the humans eating it. Cause for concern. OK, I want to take a step back and think a little bit about how all this plastic is getting into the ocean. So this is a little bit of a complicated flow chart, but um, we're not going to talk about it in great, teal, great detail. But the idea is that plastics start out as resin, most of which are formed as these little resin pellets that then get formed into plastic products. Those plastic products are either used or they're discarded as waste. And then these are pathways by which those plas that plastic can end up into the ocean. It's color coded by whether it's an activity at sea or an activity on land or both. So we can certainly, some of these pellets can be lost. There can be catastrophic, catastrophic events like tsunamis that dump a whole, kind of, whole range of materials into the ocean at once. Lost fishing gear, lost shipping containers full of Nike shoes or rubber duckies. Um, oceanographers deploy plastic in the ocean, and we don't always intend to recover it. Uh, we can have losses from other types of ships and platforms. But the only category that we really have an, an estimate, a quantitative estimate for of, from a source is um, down this discarded pathway. So these are losses that are probably not intentional. You're using the items not intention, intending to lose them. In terms of discards, we can think about properly managed waste. You put your garbage into the garbage can and it gets handled, whether it's in a landfill or burned. Um, properly managed waste shouldn't enter the environment, the exception being wastewater discharge. If some of these smallest particles don't get filtered out, you can imagine that um, the outflows that go into the environment can contain some of these small particles. But really what we thought most about, because we're suspicious this is, that this might be the largest source of plastics to the ocean, is the improperly managed waste category. So what happens to all of that waste if it's not properly managed, either because of deliberate littering or accidental littering, or because there simply isn't the waste management infrastructure to handle it? So a study that I was involved in um, estimated the amount of plastic waste generated on land that is input to the ocean in a single year. So what's interesting about this study is that we had absolutely zero data from the ocean. The way we did this was we took waste management data, data that estimated how much waste is being generated in countries around the world. This was data that came from the World Bank. How much of that is plastic? And how much of that is not properly captured and contained? And the way that this was reported was by country, not because we wanted to point fingers or figure out where the, the bullseye was on the map, but simply because the data were reported that way by the World Bank. So first, the top line uh, message is that the number is big, 8 million metric tons of plastic, we estimate, entered the ocean from waste that was generated on land. 
When you look at the map, which is the warm colors are color coding the highest values, you see that there's a very, very clear high region here in Southeast Asia. And we think the reason for this is that these are, this is a region where there are rapidly developing economies. With that is increased consumption, increased waste, and yet these are economies that have not yet built the infrastructure to deal with that increased waste, waste much of which is made of plastic. So um, this is definitely an area to focus if we want to stem the tide, if we want to stop the waste from going into the ocean. But what's really important is not to just say, oh, it's China's fault. When we look at the list of, of um, top 20 countries in putting plastic waste to the ocean, the United States is number 20 out of 192 countries, and the EU collectively is number 18. And the reason for this is not because we're litter bugs necessarily, but if you look at um, the United States, we have a very large coastline, and we have a very high coastal population. And equally important, we generate more waste, more plastic waste per person per day than anywhere else in the world. So we create a tremendous amount of plastic waste, even if all of us do the right thing all the time, but accidentally the candy wrapper flies out of your hand one day. When you add up all those lost candy wrappers, plus the intentional dumping and sort of bad actors, it adds up to a big number. So this is not something that we can ignore. We can't, this is a global problem and we are contributors. Okay, now we come to SEA. So this study here, as I mentioned, we didn't look at a drop of ocean data. So we're, we've got a number for how much we think is going in from one of a multitude of sources. At SEA, we go out to sea and we measure the ocean. So another way to, to try to gauge this problem is to say, well, how much plastic do we think is out in the ocean by going out and sampling it? So if folks aren't familiar with um, Sea Education Association and Sea Semester, we are an educational nonprofit here in Woods Hole. We have been operating since 1971, and we run the C semester program for undergraduate students who come to us for a sort of off-campus study abroad experience. They come to our campus, which is um, halfway from here to Falmouth on Woods Hole Road, and they live on our campus and study for six weeks, and they study the ocean environment from a variety of perspectives, including scientific, of course, but also maritime history, uh, marine policy, and they learn to become uh, full-fledged crew members on board our tall sailing ships, which are also scientific research vessels. So they come to us for six weeks. They propose, they construct research projects that they're going to carry out when they go out to sea on our ship, uh, either in the Atlantic or our ship in the Pacific. And then they conduct oceanographic research during their six weeks on sea as they're also fully operating the ship. So um, early on, we adopted the new Ston net, a surface towing plankton net, as a workhorse piece of gear. For many reasons, you can learn a lot by sampling the ocean surface. It's accessible. And students can pretty easily learn how to do um, all of the work to deploy, recover, and analyze the data by themselves. And a big piece of our program is developing leadership and responsibility and being able to run the ship by the time they leave it. So we have this surface towing plankton net. It's a meter wide and half a meter tall, and we tow it off the side of the ship for about a half an hour. And then here's a bird's eye view of the net being towed off the side of the ship. Um, the net mesh is about a third of a millimeter in size, so pretty small mesh, um, and we tow it at a pretty slow ship speed. And then we bring that net aboard and rinse its contents into a sieve, and here comes the fun part. Students sit in the lab with tweezers and pick out individual pieces of plastic. And from some further work that we've done now analyzing these samples historically, we know that the human eyeball does a good job selecting plastic at these sizes. If you start to get down to fibers and things like that, you really have to use chemical identification techniques. Um, but our students have been using eyeballs and tweezers for decades, and they do a really good job picking out plastics. So when they pick out the plastics, we get a count, number of particles for the net tow, and we divide that by the the area of the sea surface that we measured, and we report that concentration in terms of pieces per square kilometer. So what I'm showing you here is a map of the western North Atlantic. So we've got um, Newfoundland, we've got South America, here's the Caribbean Sea here. And what you see, each dot represents a single plankton net tow that was conducted since 1986. So now we have more than 10,000 plankton net tows um, towed and analyzed by our students over, over decades. And it's colored by the plastic concentration in pieces per kilometer squared from uh, zero, which is the dark blue, all the way up to 200,000 pieces per square kilometer. So the red values are the high values. And the stars are the highest concentrations we've measured. So the first question, and especially coming from my background in ocean physics, was, well, where is the plastic and why is it there? 
So one thing that's a little bit surprising is that the highest concentrations, these black stars, you might expect these to be pressed right up against the coast, because I just told you that 8 million metric tons of plastic is leaking off of our coastlines. But in fact, these microplastics that we collect in the net are um, all of the black stars are far from land. And in fact, this green star is the highest concentration we've ever collected. And that's 26 million pieces per square kilometers per square kilometer. And that was collected quite literally in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean above the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So when you look at this distribution, kind of squint in your eyes and look at the warm colors, what you see is there is a clear region where these, these plastics are accumulating. Um, this is the subtropical ocean gyre. And this is what people, this is really what the garbage patch is, um, centered at about 30 degrees north latitude. Now, I also mentioned that we have a ship in the Pacific, so I want to show you our Pacific data set a little bit uh, quickly here. So we're looking at the eastern Pacific Ocean. What's different about this map, it's the same in terms of one dot per plankton tow. The color shading is a little bit different because we've added a higher category here. But we're looking now at a much broader latitude range. So here's the equator. So here's the northern hemisphere. We've got the southern hemisphere. This is Tahiti, Hawaii, um, Mexico. So what you see is the highest, the highest concentrations, again, are centered at about 30 degrees north latitude. That's where the ocean currents are collecting them. But what you can really see in this image is that outside of that region, there are relatively low concentrations. So in the size ranges that we are collecting in our plankton nets, um, you can very clearly see the region of the ocean where this stuff is collecting and where it's not. Well, why is that? So I have to tell you a little bit of physical oceanography or I'd have to give up my card. Um, so I want to just show you, this is a, a numerical ocean model, modeling ocean currents that um, was created by my colleague Nikolai Maximenko at the University of Hawaii. So we're going to look at a little movie. Um, in this movie, he started the ocean basically evenly covered in fake plastic debris. So that's what these purple specks are. I'm going to turn on the ocean currents and you can see what happens. So you can see at the equator here, right in the middle of the image, it's becoming white because the material is moving away. Whereas in these regions in the subtropics, they're getting darker and darker and accumulating this debris. And these are the subtropical ocean gyres. So ocean physics happens in such a way that there are these gyres that circulate around the large ocean basins. And at these latitudes in both the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, the currents kind of slow down and converge. It's kind of like an oceanographic dead end. And so that's what's causing these floating, um, passively drifting materials like plastics to accumulate here. So this is great um, and really exciting to see. But then this is also going to show you now the utility of the plastics data that we've um, been collecting for decades, because we can now look at um, the, the plastics that we've collected in the real ocean and overlay that on the model prediction. So the color shading here is basically taking this North Atlantic patch and putting it on the ground. And then these bars are showing you the concentration that we collected in our net toes. And you can see there's a really strong correspondence there. So not only is there um, a garbage patch in the Pacific, an accumulation zone, as I like to call it, and one in the North Atlantic, this model predicts that you would find them also in the Southern Hemisphere gyres. And in these regions, there are very few ocean data. There have been sort of single cruises that go through here. And it appears that, yes, in fact, there are plastics accumulating in these regions as well. OK, so back to the high-level question of how much plastic is in the ocean from ocean data. Um, we did a study collecting all of the plankton net data that exist, or that existed as of 2015. And this is now a global map. And again, each dot is a plankton net toe. And you can see the SEA data sets here in dense concentrations in the North Atlantic and in the Eastern, North, in the Eastern Pacific. And here are those um, singular cruises I mentioned in the South, the Southern Hemisphere. So you can see there does seem to be accumulations in these regions. Um, and it's color shaded according to concentration. So you can see that. But what you can see is if you wanted to make a global average, you certainly could average all these numbers and come up with something. But the vast majority of the global ocean has not been sampled for ocean plastics. So it wouldn't be a very meaningful number. So in order to, to um, be able to make a global estimate of floating microplastics, we turn to these numerical models. So these are three models. We don't have to go into the details. This top one is the one I just showed you. There are two other flavors that are they're pretty independent, um, the way that they were constructed. And in all three of these, you can see these 
con high concentrations, the reds are happening at 30 degrees north and south. But obviously, there's great variety in the details of these models. And when you actually put these together and add up all the floating microplastics, we come up with a range of between 93,000 and 236,000 metric tons. OK, so that's a big number, right? Well, let's go back and compare that to our estimate of input from land. So this is a, a picture of the Los Angeles River after a rainstorm. This is a big boom that was used to collect the trash that was washing out. All this had been sitting on dry land until there was this big rain event. Um, so we're talking about plastic waste from land. The estimate, to remind you, was 8 million metric tons per year. And now what we've um, estimated from ocean data floating at the sea surface is basically 1% of that. 90, you know, We're talking 1,000 metric tons instead of 8 million tons per year. So this has raised a big question in the community. Where is all the plastic? This is a cartoon that's just meant to illustrate where it could be. So if you, this is kind of, think about the big white box as the marine environment. So we've got coastlines, which are beaches, but rocky shorelines and estuaries and wetlands. Here's the sea surface where we tow our nets. Here's the sea ice where I mentioned there's been um, evidence of microplastics. Here's the water column where we have lots of biota and the seafloor, including the sediments. So each of these boxes represents what I refer to as reservoirs where plastic debris could be residing. So we have a number for the little stuff in the sea surface box, but we really don't have any numbers for any of these other reservoirs. And we certainly know that there is plastic debris in all of these places, but we don't know which one of these boxes has the most because we, it's very hard to sample the ocean. As hard as it is to go out in the middle of the ocean and tow plankton nets, it's a lot harder to get seafloor images or samples or to set sample sediments. So this is, I would say, a very big open question right now. And of course, until you know where the, the debris is and what kind of debris it is, whether it's microplastics or big items or entangling items, it makes it hard to understand, hard to know what the impacts are or how to clean it up. Cleaning it up. How are we going to fix this mess? Well, the bad news is there is no silver bullet. So get rid of that. Um, how we're going to fix this mess, it's going to require a variety of um, interventions and approaches and changes. So um, this is just sort of showing this wedge approach. Uh, the, the one that's offset here is improved waste management infrastructure. And in my opinion, that is the, the top priority right now. We know that there's tremendous amount of waste in the environment that's not being captured and treated in, in waste management. So let's turn off the tap there as a first priority. Moving around, um, there is also important to do cleanups. And cleanups, in my opinion, are most effective when they start on land and maybe move slightly offshore, because that's where we think most of this material is coming from. So this is sort of the last chance. There's a last chance capture in here where you can maybe get it or clean it up before it ends up as microplastic thousands of miles offshore. There are other things like incentivizing return of fishing gear, because we know the um, entanglement risks of fishing gear. Um, the microfibers I mentioned, we could put uh, filters on our washing machines, uh, incentivize recycling so that maybe some of some of this waste that might be lost because people don't really care about it might be worth something and be captured and collected. But I think in the long term, we really have to move to this part of the of the uh, figure and thinking about really how are we using these materials. Plastics are invaluable. They were developed for a reason. It's a tremendous engineering success. We all rely upon them. But are we using them in the best possible way? And when we do use them, do we have a thought about what we're going to do with them when we're done? So this is where we start getting into innovations, thinking about how we use these materials, trying to think about full life cycles and recapturing the materials to make sure that they have value and end up being, excuse me, reused, minimizing waste and minimizing what can be lost to the environment. So. Uh, the fact that this many of you have turned out is a good indication of how much publicity and public attention there has been to this topic, and this has also caused it to reach um, really international policy agendas. So I had the opportunity to participate in discussions led by Germany when they had the presidencies of the G7 and G20, and they put this on the top of their agenda, or on their agenda, um, creating marine litter action plans. Um, and then Canada followed up. Japan also engaged on this when, during their presidencies. So, so these. Um, groups are, are engaging in marine litter as a major global problem. Uh, the UN, in a variety of capacities, has programs um, around trying to solve the problem, bring attention to it, understand the science better. And then a group of academics have even argued that we should have an international agreement on marine plastic pollution, something akin to the Paris Agreement. So there, this is being discussed at very high levels. What about in the United States? 
Uh, well, the United States actually passed the Microbead Free Waters Act of 2015 under President Obama. It was bipartisan legislation that passed without um, any kind of contention. These plastic microbeads were, are no longer allowed to be used in cosmetic products, so they've been used in things like facial scrubs and toothpaste as abrasives. And this is really what I was talking about with that wastewater. So imagine that you buy your facial scrub, you wash your face, you rinse it down the drain, you're properly disposing of that product, but the, the filters in the wastewater treatment plant may not capture it before it goes out into the environment. So this, this piece of legislation was intended to tackle what is a known um, problem. Uh, John Kerry held our first Our Ocean conference in, in 2016, and marine debris was um, a featured topic there. And then uh, most recently, in um, uh, last September, the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works held a hearing in which I was fortunate just to testify on cleaning up the oceans. And we could talk about, there's a lot of interesting things that came out of that, but for me, one of the big takeaways is that the discussion was not whether or not this was a problem. The starting point of the discussion was, this is a problem, what are we gonna do to fix it? So there are good indications. Um, and then shortly after this hearing, Congress, again, bipartisan piece of legislation was the Save Our Seas Act of 2018, which mainly the, the outcome was to reauthorize the Marine Debris Act, which allows the NOAA Marine Debris Program to continue existing. Um, it's not all good news though. Um, as I mentioned, Canada and the G7 did come up with this ocean plastics charter, but unfortunately the US was uh, refused to sign it. So the US and Japan didn't sign this charter. So there's work to be done. Well, that's great, but um, what about what are we gonna do? We don't have to wait for the, the US government or for these high level um, policy groups to do something. So like many things, let's just think about what we can do locally. And this is where Falmouth is really, I think, leading in many ways. So you probably know that there's been local legislation passed. Um, the, uh, plastic bags um, are banned from many stores, uh, approved in 2014, so quite a few years ago. And uh, more recently, polystyrene foam has been banned. I think that's now a phase out um, pl place. It was passed just this past November. So local legislation can have an impact, especially when it's targeted to things that maybe have you know, no negative impacts or maybe they're easily replacements. And then there are also a lot of local campaigns going on. So um, SEA, together with Falmouth Water Stewards, um, wrote a grant proposal to NOAA's Marine Debris Program to conduct a behavior change, a sort of local public education campaign about reducing use of single-use plastics where we can. And so we've named that the Trash and Splash Campaign. We've worked with all of the local Woods Hole restaurants. You'll see signage in there saying, do you really need that straw? Um, trying to help them figure out how to phase out single-use plastics where possible, and at the same time, educate the consumers, the customers that are coming into those businesses so that they don't have blowback um, and angry people who just want their straw. So a lot of what we really promoted was, you know, things like straw upon request. Don't give people a plastic straw unless they ask for one. Uh, and then we've also been working in K through 12 schools. And a big part of that project was um, through the Falmouth Water Stewards was a group of middle school um, girls who I think are about to be high school girls now are <laughs> coming up. They started to skip the straw program in, in town. So you'll see um, this partnership. And then if anybody knows Alan Robinson, he moved to town, I, I don't know, like 10 minutes ago, and he's already got eight um, funding for eight uh, refill reuse Falmouth uh, water refill stations. So this is actually the first one um, that's over by, um, in the, off of Main Street here by the, the public restrooms. So these are piped into Falmouth water. You can bring your own reusable water bottle and fill up your water bottle for free with sparkling clean, clean Falmouth water, reducing um, single use water bottle use. And he's very uh, recently with a number of other people started a Falmouth litter reduction team. So there's a lot going on locally, lots of ways to engage. What can I do, even if you don't want to get engaged with big groups? I think first and foremost, if we all make less waste, there's less that we need to deal with. Um, so this is really just the waste management hierarchy. This is like, this is not, this is not new, right? Use less. Um, reuse, so in, you know, use your, bring your reusable water bottle and coffee mug and produce bags and straws and utensils. And that will allow you to avoid those single use products. So that's really kind of the focus of our trash and splash campaign. Um, recycle what you can, of course. And then um, some people may want to engage in conversations with manufacturers of products and say, you know, you gave us this package. You should help us figure out what to do with it. So that's um, uh, uh, under the umbrella of extended producer responsibility, which has actually been legislated in Europe, but is much easier, much harder to do here. 
Um, then there are things like last chance captures. So this is actually um, Mr. Trash Wheel. He was built in Baltimore by a man named John Kellett, whose son is actually a current C semester student. So we had him on a panel today speaking to the class, and I learned a lot of the history of Mr. Trash Wheel, who's an extremely charismatic solar and hydro-powered water wheel that simply collects trash that comes down the Jones Falls River in Baltimore, goes up this ramp and falls into a dumpster. So it gets collected and towed away and properly disposed of before it goes into the ocean. And Mr. Trash Wheel has a Twitter feed and Mr. Trash Wheel has two friends, Professor Trash Wheel and Captain Trash Wheel, who all have distinct personalities. Really an internet sensation, a great success story. I highly encourage you to Google Mr. Trash Wheel. Um, so this is a really effective way, you know, to, he, and he just would walk by Baltimore Harbor every day, he said, and would hear tourists saying, ugh, the harbor is so disgusting. And he would watch this trash flow out after a rainstorm and said, just decided I'm gonna do something about it. And so this is a real success story, but broadly cleaning up litter anywhere and everywhere. And that's what this Falmouth Litter Initiative is thinking about, especially in, in beach cleanups, because we know those of course are right on the ocean. And then, you know, it's, this is like tell your friends and family there are things you can do in your own business or in your own school, reduction and recycling initiatives. And I really encourage folks to engage with the local government and the public works department because that's how some of these things really come to be, is working with the town officials who know how things operate and know what the barriers are. Um, so just engaging in your community in any way that you can or just at your household level with your friends or your family. So with that, I just want to end with um, a massive acknowledgement slide. Um, first and foremost, None of this would be possible without the more than 8,000 C semester students that have been um, going to sea and collecting plastics for decades. And um, I wouldn't be here if not for them. And then there are many um, SEA, collaborators. SEA collaborators. This is a small fraction who've contributed to this work over the decades. Um, Chris Reddy deserves a special call out because he at, um, he's at Woods Oceanographic. He really pushed us and said, you need to get that data out there. Nobody knows what you're doing. So he was really a big impetus in getting our first paper published, um, as well as collaborators at University of Hawaii. And then some of that high level estimation work about 8 million metric tons and 8.2 billion tons, that came out of a working group out of the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. So these are some of my colleagues in that working group. And then support from federal agencies, but also the Ocean Conservancy um, and the Doherty Foundation. So with that, I would like to say thank you. Questions? Uh, terrific talk. Thank you very much. Um, you, most of your uh, solution ideas were on the supply side. You made one mention on the, it should be the demand side, but one mention on the, on the supply side about, and you said that it was really hard to deal with the manufacturing side. Can you say a little bit more about that side of it, please? Yes, thank you for asking that because that was actually not my intention and I, I should have, it occurs to me now that I should have put one other bullet on there. Uh, part of, um, I've been fortunate to work with a group called the Trash Receipts Alliance, which was put together by the Ocean Conservancy at the same time that they supported this working group to advance the science. And the group is actually, the membership is largely big corporations who either make plastics or make plastic products or use plastic products. I mean, we're talking about Dow Chemical, we're talking about um, Coca-Cola, we're, you know, big companies. And those are in the same room with NGOs, and then I serve as, as one of a few science advisors to sort of keep the conversation honest. And they are looking to find common ground where they can um, affect solutions. And so that group, after we estimated this huge input of plastic waste from land, has decided to invest in waste management in Southeast Asia. And how that's actually gonna be realized remains to be seen. There's huge money. I think they know that this is a problem. They don't want their products out there. There's been brand shaming. There are lots of people who are really trying to attack them. And I think they're trying to take the high road and act where they will. Now, they're not going to stop making plastic. And I don't think we can reasonably ask them to do that. So they're going to put money towards waste management. Um, but also there was just um, an initiative announced in Davos two days ago, a group of these, I think it's Unilever and PepsiCo, um, Procter & Gamble are now trying to start a reusable container system, sort of basically reinventing the milkman. I don't know what the feasibility of this actually working is. They are creating like 
stainless steel hagen dazs containers and you buy it and then somebody picks it up and cleans it and brings it back. They're engaging. Um, but you're absolutely right. We are consumers and we have power and I think that's why they're engaging. So, um, you know, as part of a suite of solutions, you're, you're going to see more from them. They may not be doing everything and they're probably not going to stop making plastic. On the um, same topic of the um, pie chart that you had displayed, do you think there's a space for uh, um, biomedic or uh, replacement materials, kind of like a bio-inspired plastics or uh, other biodegradable type materials? Mm -hmm. Yeah, biodegradable plastics or compostable plastics are, are challenging. Um, yes, maybe. I think there could be places for that. So let's remember the slide that came before that. <laughs> so there are definitely um, folks who just say, well, let's just make it all biodegradable. We can throw it out our car window and it'll disappear. Well, that's you don't want people to think that biodegradable means do whatever. Um, there are materials that exist that are bio-based. Bio-based doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that it will break down either in nature or in a composting facility. So you have to be very careful about what materials you're talking about. So even if it's made out of corn, it doesn't mean it's going to disintegrate. But there are some materials that will biodegrade, but they biodegrade in an industrial composting facility. Um, and p lots of, in fact, we found that a lot of the Woods Hole restaurants, we didn't come in and tell them this about this new problem that they'd never heard of, right? So they were already taking some measures, and a lot of them said, oh, well, we're using greenware. And that's great, but it's great if you have a place for that greenware to go where it's going to end up in an industrial composting facility. And if you don't, then it means it's going to go into the regular trash can. And if it's lost into the ocean, it's just as much of a hazard. So I think we have to be careful and also remember that, that the properties of plastic that make it so useful and versatile are things like durability and strength and resistance to biodegradation. So many of the applications um, for plastics don't lend themselves to a material that will break down in a short short period of time. So I personally would like to see us just use less single-use stuff than trying to make it out of something that will break down, whether in industrial composting or not. I had a similar question um, about biodegradable plastics, but I'm wondering, as you're talking, with a biodegradable plastic, are there still actual plastic plastics, oil-based plastics in mixed in with the biodegradable? Do you know anything about that? You mean in an individual item, are they mixed? So if you had like a cornstarch bag, is it all cornstarch plastic or, or are there oil-based plastics in there as well? Do you yeah, know? that's a good question. So th this is where, you know, consumer beware. Um, six pack rings that hold your beverages, right? So when I was a teenager, I knew that I had to cut up my six pack rings so I didn't kill some marine animal. I knew nothing more than that's what I was supposed to do. Well, um, those six-pack rings are now made of, of plastic that is called photodegradable. So it is a traditional plastic, but bound with starch molecules that allow it to fragment. So the idea is that if the six-pack ring gets lost in the ocean, it will fragment and it won't be an entanglement hazard. That's great, but now it's generating a tremendous amount of microplastics. So you're solving one problem, but perhaps contributing to another. So. Um, I think it depends on the individual item. You really have to read what these things are made of. And I myself have fallen for what I thought was compostable, and I accidentally bought something that was just made out of corn. So yeah, it's just I think you just have to be careful. Uh, well, I'm going over here, Kara. What about uh, China, the big dog on the block with regard to uh, sources? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So, chi I mean, China is an interesting one. Um, the Trash Receives Alliance, in, in following up on that study, and we, when we put out that study, right, none of those numbers are right in the sense of, I mean, we think it's right to an order of magnitude, and we did enough sort of, um, you know, moving around with the numbers, making ch challenging our assumptions to make sure that we think the the general kind of order is plus or minus right. So we don't think like the U.S. has got leap up to number one. Um, but you really need to go to these places and measure what's on the ground. Measure, and nobody really is measuring what's flowing out of a river. I mean, very few data of that flux exist. Um, but the people who are going and working on waste management are going to Indonesia and Vietnam. Um, 
and Thailand. I don't know of anybody going into China. I think it's a tough nut to crack. But China also used to be, until very recently, the country that took in all of our waste, our single stream, our mixed plastics, our mixed paper, because they had a workforce that could pick through it excuse me, that could pick through it and make a living. And they have since put up what's called the green fence, um, national sword is the policy. So they are now turning away um, recycling you know, containers that, that are above a really minimal amount of contamination, which basically doesn't exist. So that's really challenged our recycling in this country because we're all used to just dumping it all in one big bin and then figuring that somebody somewhere somehow is sorting it and that somebody somewhere somehow is no longer China. So that's, yeah, that's a good question. I had a question about the plastic fibers. Mm -hmm. Do they come strictly from things like netting or do they come from other types of plastics? So that's a good question and we don't really know. I mean, we can look at the, the composition of the fibers and so we can say, yes, they're polyester or nylon or whatever the material is. Um, I think a lot of people like to talk about clothes and washing machines because there has been a study that sort of shows that fibers shed off clothing in the washing machine, they can come out. But really, I mean, look at around us with carpets and upholstery and microfiber cloths that you use to clean with, um, your furniture, your car seats. I mean, there's, there's fibers everywhere. So it's not just your synthetic clothing. And a lot of the fibers actually are natural materials. They'll, they'll be cellulose based or cotton or wool. So it's really important to know what type of material the fiber is that's contaminating the fish or the shellfish or whatever. Um, but it may be more important that it's a fiber. This is where some of this, you know, what is really the impact? Does it matter that it's a long, skinny thing that might be able to cross into the bloodstream? Or does it matter that it's a long, skinny thing that's made of plastic versus cotton? Uh, we don't know the answers to those questions yet. That's a really t I don't know what the solution is to fibers. <laughs> I like my fleece. I live in Maine. Uh, we have a question here. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. It's been very interesting, very informative. But you have mentioned a couple times corn and um, you know, biodegradable, that it's not biodegradable or something? Or what is that? It depends on the material. So um, most traditional plastics are made from fossil fuel sources, so oil or natural gas. You can also make those from... Um, plant-based sources like ethanol, sugar cane. So the end product is the same. It's the same molecule. Oh, so yeah. corn-based traditional plastics are no more biodegradable than oil-based traditional plastics. There is another category of polymer called PLA, polylactic acid, also made from corn, and I, or maybe I, I'm not entirely sure of the constituents, but plant-based, that is biodegradable in that particular environmental condition of an industrial composting. Facility. So that's, thank you for asking that and clarifying, because it is confusing. Um, I enjoyed your um, talk very much. I, was, I have a comment and a question. The question has to do with the um, health risks associated with eating seafood, be they shellfish or, you know, regular fish. And then two, um, if you're only looking at uh, floating debris, you're missing part of the problem. Given the density differences of these materials are denser than seawater in some cases. So maybe some of it is sitting on the bottom. No, absolutely. And in the beginning of the talk, I tried to make clear that although I was going to focus on stuff floating, we know there's material at the seafloor. The challenge is that we don't have enough information on the seafloor to say, is there more sitting as big stuff on the seafloor, or is it all microplastics and sea ice, or is it all sitting on beaches? And it's interesting in the scientific community in this, in this field because there's definitely the it's all sitting on the seafloor camp, and there is the it's all sitting on the coastline camp, and I'm sort of like, I don't really know yet. <laughs> um, so that's absolutely right. I mean, we know we're missing it. In fact, we're only measuring a very small size range floating. So we're, that doesn't even account for the big stuff that's floating like I showed you from the Japanese tsunami. So absolutely. Um, human health. We know that we're ingesting plastics when we eat seafood. I still eat seafood, I'm not concerned about it. I'm more concerned about my exposure to plastics and all my other activities because relative to what I'm exposed to through my seafood, I'm getting much more exposure on my skin and potentially inhaling it. Um, that doesn't mean it's never gonna be a problem and it doesn't mean it's not a problem for the animals that are eating those things, but that's why it's such an active area of research and that's why it's so hard because the plastics, 
it's not a single material. It's a variety of polymers. Some of them float, some of them sink. There's a variety of additives. They behave differently in the environment. They're different shapes and sizes. So we, it's not like you're just studying one thing. You're studying this really heterogeneous pollutant. And so you have to be really careful about what you learn in these laboratory experiments and then how, what that tells you about the real world, whether human or marine animal. If we accept that the problem is with us for the future, because all we can do is reuse, reduce, and so forth, and manage what, we, we, um, uh, what we're doing, uh, we're not fixing the mess at all. We are making it a little, we're growing it more slowly. So what does the world look like in 100 years' time? Oh. That's a great question. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, we've already dubbed this era the Anthropocene because we're going to see these layers of plastic in landfills and beach sediments. Um, you're right. I mean, even if we reduce the way that we use these materials, that plastics production curve is probably not going to slow down. So I don't know. I mean, I, I sort of feel like... Plastics aren't going away, and we need to think about that, what we do with them when we're done with them. And that needs to be, the, the producer needs to be involved with that, whether it's the person that makes the plastic or the person that makes the product. And we need to be good consumers in how we make our decisions and then how we treat our waste. But that's, a, I mean, yeah, the, the world will still have plenty of plastic in 100 years. I just hope that, you know, we're not unable to eat seafood because we've now determined that it's, you know, it's killing us. Um, and thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, in a community like Woods Hole that is a uh, both affluent and B close to the coastline, I wonder if it's somewhat easier to convince people to um, have single-use products, whereas in places that are maybe not as close to the coastline or have a lower socioeconomic status, I wonder what ways we could make uh, reducing our plastic both feasible for those communities where the ease is very important um, and the inexpensivity is very important, um, as well as not maybe at the forefront of their thoughts. Thanks for that question. I mean, that it's interesting because we think about, okay, so Falmouth is a relatively affluent community, community in our region, so how do we reach sort of other communities close to us? But then we even think about places, communities in Africa where there is no clean water and they literally buy pouches of water to survive. And so you can't remove, you can't take those away. And that clearly is like, we need to work on clean water for those communities. So there's that, that's like a bigger problem that the plastic is a symptom of. Um, more locally, you know, I, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. I, I, I think about plastic bag bans and some of the arguments that, um, you know, you're disadvantaging people who can't buy reusables. And the way that you overcome that is when you institute that, the stores maybe are subsidized to do it, but give away some reusable bags. So I don't know exactly how to do that. I'd have to think more about it. But we are intelligent, thoughtful, entrepreneurial people, and we can figure that out. Like that one seems like we can we can do that, and and we can do Africa water, but that's a much bigger beast to tackle. But it's true, we can't say you can't have your pouches of water. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, I, I I think we are all here in this audience, and and all of the, the population are the silver bullet to solve this problem. However, I don't think plastics are the only problem. There have been several studies uh, readily available where plastics only represent 10% of the worldwide waste that is going somewhere, be it in a landfill or be it in the ocean. I think an interesting aspect of this uh, in, in future study would be to look at within 10 to 15 miles of a coastline and see what the bottom of the ocean looks like and see what materials which are heavier than plastic materials are actually on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Because 90%, um, it is a fairly large number. That's true. Uh, most of that is organics. So when you think about waste, actually, one of the best things we can do is divert organics to composting. <laughs> and that will severely reduce our waste stream. Um, there have been, I mean, it's not that there's no information about what's on the seafloor. And you're right. I mean, you'll see the tire, the kitchen sink, and things like that. Um, at least by count, when we look at what's on the beach, and in many of the seafloor studies, most of it, at least in part, is composed of plastic. But I take your point. I mean, surely there are centuries of glass 
whatever is sitting on the seafloor. The thing with, with um, glass and metal, at least, as some of the sort of major materials that we use and dispose of, um, they do sink and they don't really move. So the, the, the thing with plastics, and when we started um, in this working group I mentioned, we took marine debris as all materials, and we pretty quickly narrowed in on plastics, not because they're evil and we hate them and people love to hate them, but because there's actually really good reasons for that. Not only are they the most abundant things floating, um, but they transform over time. So these, these chemicals I talked about can come and go, the additives can leach out, other things can sorb. They break down into smaller and smaller pieces. We don't think they ever biodegrade in the environment. I mean. It's hard to say that positively or that they never will. Um, but they move around, they transform, they interact with wildlife the same way. Whereas a glass bottle or, you know, unexploded ordnance or the kitchen sink is kind of sitting there. And unless you have some kind of major disruptive event, it's probably just sitting there and affecting the immediate area. So I take your point. I mean, plastics are not, yeah, it's not 90% of our waste stream, um, but it's, it is an increasing number. So I would like to thank Kara for this great talk and also uh, for the discussion that we just had. Um, and also to each one of you for being here today. So please, uh, thank you to everyone and Kara. Thank you. If you, would, if you would like your own Trash and Splash sticker, they are on the table in the back, as well as some postcards that um, are made with artwork from the local K-12 through community. We had a call for ocean art, and we created some messaging postcards with those. So I welcome you to take those and share them. Thank you.